right, we're going to finish up talking about um, what we had left in the introduction to therapeutic exercise chapter for starters, and then we'll move into range of motion. A lot of range of motion talk will be reviewed from what we covered in lab last week, um, and then we'll move into kind of some of the differences with stretching compared to range of motion. They do have some similarities, but they are definitely distinctly different. So. I believe we left off. I was just about to go through these motor learning stages and um, probably Greg will talk about these more in neuro um, next semester because it's definitely a key thing when we're looking at helping kids learn new skills or helping people relearn skills that they may have taken for granted before they had some sort of neuro neurological event or nerve injury of some type. Um, so basic motor learning that's just how does our body figure out how to perform the tasks that we're asking it to do um, and you just think as an adult you're like oh i just need to do this i'm just going to do it and it's going to happen and, and part of our ability to do things fairly easily as an adult is that we've already mastered a lot of basic skills that go into some of those newer skills that we that we do um, there's definitely something to the saying of you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, when our mind is younger, our brain is younger, it does have better neuroplasticity. So as we try and help create connections between different neurons that help us develop smooth coordinated motions, it definitely is easier when you're a kid to do those things. Maybe not so much when we're very young, but certainly in those um, grade school and like middle school years, um, it's a lot easier to develop fluid, smooth movements than it might be if you try to pick up a new skill at 20 or 30 years old. Um, I started playing golf um, in college, um, took a golf class. I'm left-handed. The only golf clubs they had were right-handed. So I really had to learn that swing kind of from scratch um, as an adult. And you know, I've played golf for many years. I don't play as much as I used to, but my swing is not as fluid as I think it might have been had I been able to have some left-handed clubs where I could have picked up on some of the similarities between my baseball swing and a golf swing because I did swing a baseball bat from the left side. Um, so it, I'm not, a, you know, don't look great playing golf um, compared to somebody that started playing golf when they were six, eight, ten years old. Um, that usually have a better ability to generate a lot of club speed and, and really look really relaxed and, and smooth when they're doing that movement. So that's just kind of one example of how it does become a little bit more difficult in some ways to learn skills. Kind of the basics are easier maybe as an adult because we already have that um, experience doing a lot of different things and we can try to apply those to a new, new situation or a new task at hand. So we've got these three stages. Um, cognitive, associative, and autonomous. And, and our cognitive is when we really have to think hard about what we're doing. Um, in that stage in particular, it's super helpful to have a good um, understanding of the proper positions that we need to be in to execute that skill. Um, and that's where having a coach, having somebody watching you, setting you up in the right position for success is a lot helps you acquire that skill a lot more quickly than if you're just trying to figure it out on your own through trial and error. Um, the associative task or associative stage um, is where we do need to get some repetitions in. And as we do those repetitions of the task, then we figure out, oh, I didn't quite pull that off the way I wanted to. Sometimes you do, and you may not understand why it worked that way. And so in that particular stage, we've got this fine tuning of motor tasks. So we're trying to minimize errors and that's where feedback is really, really helpful. Um, I'll probably go through kind of throwing to a target as an example, as we kind of work through the, these next few slides. And, and if you think about as you start learning how to throw, shoot a free throw, how to kick a ball through a goal, how to throw over home plate and get it to the catcher how to throw a dart at a dartboard. Um, if you've never done those things before, again, if we get in the proper stance, that's gonna increase our chances of success. That's kind of more the cognitive stage. This is how you need to stand. You wanna position your feet this way. You need to bring your arm back to this position. 
Um, and we kind of go through step by step when you're going to shift your weight, when you're going to try and cock your arm back, when you're going to try and accelerate through the target, kind of those things are more the cognitive stage. In the associative stage, we're getting that feedback. We look at the results. Did you hit the bullseye on that dartboard or did you miss the board completely? If you miss the board low, then we know, okay, I need to throw either harder so the dart makes it to the board before it starts losing momentum and falling down, or I need to aim a little bit higher potentially. So we get this feedback based on what we saw. Um, that's kind of our external feedback. Um, we're going to get internal feedback kind of based on what is our, our, our nervous system telling us about that. How do the receptors in our skin, in our joints, in our muscles, in our connective tissues, what is it telling us proprioceptively about how our body position was when it was a bad throw or a bad you know, toss with a dart? Or, or what, when was it successful? How did things feel? And so we start integrating those internal sensations, those internal feedback cues, along with the external feedback cues of what we saw. And then again, in that stage, if you have somebody that's watching you that can correct you, or if you have the opportunity to videotape yourself or videotape a patient and then go back through that videotape, then it becomes a lot easier to kind of dissect where the errors were. And the quicker we can reduce those errors, whether through our own internal feedback, the external feedback that we're getting from watching the result or from getting somebody else watching us and correcting us, then we're gonna be able to reach that next stage, that autonomous stage a lot faster. We really don't have to think about it. It is much more automatic and, and we can focus on some other things at the same time. We can have a conversation with somebody while we're throwing that dart and still maybe be accurate. Or if you think about say a, a college or NBA basketball player um, trying to shoot free throws, they want that skill to be so well rehearsed, so automatic. They set up to the line the same way all the time. They try and think about their body position before they release the ball or even get into the shooting motion to try and set themselves up for the most success. Um, they're able to block out those distractions. Um, so they can quiet their mind, not pay attention to those people screaming at them, waving their arms back and forth, whatever it is behind the backboard, um, and just let things take over kind of automatically. So that's what we ultimately want to help our patients get to, where they can just execute the skill and be able to attend to other things. For most physical therapy settings, a lot of times we're dealing with making sure they can do things, they can pay attention to the safety um, issues and any potential hazards and dangers while they're executing that skill. So for, say we have somebody that had a stroke and they lost um, vision in one eye, um, they still have to learn how to walk and cross streets and things like that, but they've lost part of the big picture. And so they need to be able to know automatically, I need to get in the habit of turning my head much more than I used to when I was walking so that I can still safely cross that street. I can look where the curb is so I don't trip falling off of that curb or coming up onto that curb. I can look and attend to all the different things going on with traffic, whether it's other foot traffic or vehicle traffic. I can pay attention to whether the walk signal is activated or not. Um, and so that's really where we want to get our patients to. And so we're really going to be involved a lot in many cases with both that cognitive stage and that associative stage in helping people improve um, to get to the point where they can just do it on their own and still um, be able to pay attention to other things also. All right, so things to think about when we're setting our practice situations up or working with patients in therapy, um, we definitely need to have the patient paying attention. If they're not paying attention, it's not gonna stick. Um, and, and certainly people that have been students, hopefully you can understand that. If you have two classes in a given day and you've got a test coming up in the second class and you're in lecture, but you're not really paying attention to lecture in the first class because you're looking at your notes for the upcoming test, well, you're not really getting much out of class um, because you're not really focused on what's being presented and really engaging your mind and paying attention to all those things. So we need to try and set up the practice environment so that we do capture that patient's attention. We need to help them understand the with them, the what's in it for them. 
um, so that they are more likely to be engaged and really listen to what we're telling them, watch what we're demonstrating and, and those type of things. So that's, that's critical because if we don't have them, you know, paying attention, they're not going to get much out of anything that we're doing with them. And then we're all wasting our time. So you can see the big um, letters, hopefully over there in that slide, practice correctly um, and practice makes permanent. So sometimes you'll hear that saying practice makes perfect. And that's just definitely not true. Um, perfect practice makes perfect. If you're practicing things incorrectly, you're going to groove the incorrect motor pattern, and then it becomes much harder to break yourself out of that habit and improve how you're doing that skill. So we do want them to practice correctly, and that's where it's critical for us to provide really good corrective feedback early on as a patient is learning a skill or trying to relearn a skill so that they get it right from the start. And, and that's where like, when we're teaching a kid how to do a given skill, if we can help them understand that, you know, those perfect techniques early on, then their chance for success at that sport throughout their life improves dramatically rather than trying to break bad habits after they've already been ingrained. So we have different ways of, of doing that. We have what's called part versus whole practice. Part practice is just breaking down that skill into its individual components. Whole practice is just execute the whole skill and see how it works out. And so many times we want to kind of start with the practice, especially if we're teaching somebody a new skill. If you think about like throwing a, a ball, um, whether it's a football or a baseball or whatever, softball, if we're doing an overhead throw. Um, we, we need to turn our body somewhat sideways so that we have the correct stance so that we can step forward with our lead foot, plant on the ground with our back foot. And, and that's going to put us in a better position to kind of have that trunk rotation and, and set our arm up for the proper arm angle. If we're facing the target straight on, then we have to end up turning our body in that first motion. Whereas if we just set up with our stance correctly in the first place, then we're kind of minimizing some of those possible points of error. So if we turn our body sideways, then we might um, next work on practicing just the stride motion. Let's say I'm just, I've got my stance correct. I'm going to lift my front foot up, bring my knee up a little bit towards my chest, and then I'm going to step forward so that I can think about doing my weight shift so that when I do try to impart some velocity to the ball, I've got that motion going. And so you might just practice that stride motion. Pick up the foot, step forward. Pick up the foot, step forward. Pick up the foot, step forward. Once we've kind of mastered that, then we can move into the next part and kind of think about what I need to do with my arm. And as you're stepping back, then you're cocking that arm back. As you're stepping your foot forward, now you're starting to accelerate that arm forward. So you can practice that component. Eventually, you start adding all those pieces of the full movement together. And then we try and do it all at once. And that's where we get to the whole practice, where we just execute the given skill. And it, it, it's an efficient way to do things in many cases, because you can find a error in how the person is doing one particular part of that motion and correct that and that can end up in having a kind of a domino effect that improves the whole motion overall so that's kind of the difference with that and there's certainly value to both types of practice and certainly the closer somebody gets to trying to actually be able to perform the skill independently then we want them to be able to have mastered that whole practice motion um, the practice order is another um, component that we can do to kind of mix things up. Blocked order practice just means we're practicing one particular part over and over again. So like the stepping motion, that stride forward motion and the throwing motion, we're just going to do that six times in a row. Um, and that's the blocked order. Random order, you're kind of doing mixing up the sequence. So you might have them practice instead of practicing the, the stepping motion, you might be working on just the arm motion first, and then you're going to come back to the stepping motion. Um, so it's not that all random order practice basically just means you're mixing up the normal order so that it makes the person a little bit more adaptable and better able to deal with changes in their environment um, and still be able to execute the skill in a safe and effective way. Um, random slash block order practice is kind of blend of those two. You're doing given components of the whole motion um, out of order 
but potentially multiple times. And, and so there's a lot of different ways to apply this. It really just depends on the skill that we're, that we're doing, um, how that's going to work out. But those are important things to think about. And we'll get into kind of doing that a little bit more when we get into in therapeutic procedures, certainly when we look at teaching somebody that does have some limitations, how to roll over in bed, how to sit up, how to stand up, just these really common functional movement skills. If all of a sudden you've lost nervous system control of one half of your body, like after a stroke, or you've got a partial spinal cord injury and you have some of the muscles are firing, but not all of them, then we have to kind of figure out how to relearn how to recruit those different muscles to be able to pull off that motion in a safe and effective way. And so the more variability we can give the person, especially kind of an intermediate stage of, of motor learning, then, then we are gonna give them a better ability to have some flexibility and, and be able to adapt in changing environments, whether all of a sudden they're on a tile floor versus a thick carpeted floor versus uneven flooring outside, walking through the grass. Um, that variability just helps them better integrate the sensory feedback that they're getting and, and make the motor movement that they're trying to accomplish smoother because it is just a little bit, not a, they're not so restricted that they can only do things if I set things up just this way. It gives them that, that um, adaptability that we really need to keep patients safe in a wide variety of um, settings. Um, we need the physical practice. We also need the mental practice. And, and, you know, visual imagery is a great way to do mental rehearsal. Um, if we have the patient really imagine what their body should be doing as they're executing a skill and kind of think through that process before they attempt it, then it can be oftentimes much better than if they just attempted it without really thinking it through the first time. So, so we do need both parts. We need to kind of engage that learning part, what's going on in the brain, and how does that translate to the physical part, the motor part, as we try to execute those given skills. Um, so we do have a, a number of different types of feedback that we can provide. Let me pull up my book real quick, and um, I'll read through some of those because I don't think the next slide really talks about it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Pulled it up ahead of it. I'm sorry. So yeah, we can have um, different types of feedback. We have knowledge of performance versus knowledge of results. So knowledge of performance is more the intrinsic feedback about the quality of the movement that we did. What did we feel internally as we tried to execute that skill that we're learning? Did it feel like I had my weight shift right? Did it feel like my arm angle was correct? to throw the football down the field? Did it feel like my weight shift was correct from my back leg to my front leg as I was doing that? Um, did I lose my balance after I threw the ball? And, and that tells me that I didn't do something right um, because we wanna keep our balance so we have better control. So those are kind of our knowledge of performance, kind of what did we feel? Knowledge of result is more, what did it look like? Was I able to hit the target? Did I throw the ball down the field to the right part of the field that I was trying to achieve? Um, and so both of those are important. And again, the intrinsic feedback is mostly what we're feeling. Um, the augmented or extrinsic feedback are usually what we either see um, from the result, the ball that went somewhere that we wanted to throw it in that same place, or it can be um, that feedback from another person that's telling us, or we're watching the video after the fact um, and trying to match up what we saw, what we heard from the feedback that the person gave us, along with that intrinsic, what did it feel like when I did it well? What did it feel like when I didn't do things correctly? Um, you can have feedback provided in different ways. We can do what's called a concurrent feedback. So each repetition, you're basically giving that person feedback about what they should have done differently, what they should have done um, better to execute that skill or we can do post response kind of after they do multiple reps, then you're like, okay, what did that feel like? How did that, how did that work? What do you think it felt like? Did you think you did it right? Did you think you did it wrong? Um, and there's pros and cons of both. 
you know, that immediate feedback is more important early on when somebody's really first getting those basic motions down because we want those to be correct from the start. Um, when we're doing more of the whole practice and we've kind of mastered the basic stuff, then many times that delayed feedback is a little bit better in that the person has a chance to kind of think through the whole motion. They know what each component's supposed to be and supposed to feel like and how did it feel overall? And why do you think you did it well? Why do you think you didn't do it well? And what was the result from that? Um, we can also have variable or constant feedback where we might give the person feedback every repetition or we might only do it periodically. And that can be kind of a case if you like videotape somebody, you might have them do 10 swings with the bat or 10 throws with the ball. And then let's come watch the tape and see what you did. And that, that becomes good and bad in that the longer from the time you have a given repetition that you wait to observe it and get the feedback, you kind of lose that internal sense of what things felt like. Um, so that's one of the big advantages of giving feedback more often is that after each rep, you can kind of sense, what did it feel like to me? Yeah, I can understand why I didn't do that skill right because it didn't feel like I got my weight in the right place. It didn't feel like I brought my arm through the throwing zone correctly. Um, the advantage of more variable feedback is it gives the person a better chance to intrinsically kind of self-correct things from repetition to repetition and see if the corrections that they think were good actually were. And did they improve the accuracy, the velocity, the, the just the overall skill of that given motion? So lots of different types of feedback that we can offer. Um, and there are, like I say, early on, more frequent and, and feedback during that part component of practice is really critical. But once they start getting closer to moving into the um, associative stage, um, then we want to provide feedback a little bit less often as we go so that they have a better chance to just learn from themselves. All right, so just a few last little principles about exercise and some of these we talked about in lab with the five drum components. Um, so Wolf's Law, the first time I heard it is really applying it to um, bone health, um, how if we put stress on the bones through like weight bearing activities, it's gonna stimulate the bone to wanna to grow more bone so it becomes stronger and better able to tolerate those forces. Um, but it doesn't just happen with bone, it's gonna happen really with kind of all of our body tissues, um, whether it's heart tissue and its ability to generate force with contraction, whether it's muscle tissue, whether it's um, tendons, ligaments, bone, whatever the case might be. Um, if we don't use things, they tend to get weaker. If we use them more often, the body tends to go, hey, we need to do something to strengthen this up so that it can handle those forces a little bit better. So we do want to kind of think about applying Wolf's Law with all of our different um, exercise components. Um, basic exercise physiology principles are kind of these next handful of slides. We've got what's called the overload principle. And, and that was earliest on, I think it was applied to resistance training in particular. Um, and, and sometimes you'll hear it talk about um, PRE exercise, progressive resistive exercise. And really all that is, is that as you get stronger, if we want Wolf, Wolf's Law to hold up and we want to keep getting stronger, then we have to keep increasing the challenge. And whether we increase that challenge by adding more weight, by adding more repetitions, by adding a bigger arc of motion, by adding another exercise that challenges the muscles at a slightly different angle. All those things are ways that we can overload a given muscle to help it understand how to develop and, and create the stimulus that's gonna to lead to more actin and myosin thickening and more force production, essentially. Um, so again, overload principle originally was more so developed for cardiovascular or for strength training than anything, but it definitely applies to cardiovascular exercise. It can apply to flexibility exercise. If we continually try to stretch further and further and further, well, our muscles will adapt and they'll be able to go further and further and further through a given range of motion. If we are trying to improve our endurance with running or cycling or swimming, if we can only do 10 minutes for starters and we keep doing 10 minutes on a regular basis, pretty soon we're gonna be able to do 12 minutes and 14 minutes and 18 minutes and 20 minutes and so on. Um, so it does allow us to 
adapt to the forces that we're putting through our body and the body can make the improvements that it needs to to kind of help us be able to get better at going longer, get better at pushing a heavier weight, get better at going through a bigger arc of motion or whatever um, fitness component we're talking about. So overload principle is pretty, pretty well known. Um, specificity of training, sometimes this is called the SAID principle, specific adaptations to impose demands, S-A-I-D, um, basically the same, same idea. And, and this is really just, if you wanna get better at doing something, you need to do that thing, or you need to do things that are very closely mimicking the motions, the forces, the energy demands of that given skill. So we do wanna think about the mode, the velocity, what position we're doing that in and exactly how that movement is taking place. And I've got this gentleman flipping over the tractor tire. Um, I don't know about you, but it's not something I really have to do very often, if ever. So it's a generally strengthening exercise. It does make you do some dynamic lifting. It makes you get into some kind of awkward body positions. Um, you know, if you're a furniture mover, I think that's a great specific exercise. If you are a cyclist, um, a runner, a baseball player, and not so much. You never really have to do those type of things. If you're an offensive or defensive lineman in football, well, flipping a tire, that does mimic some of the challenges of matching up against your opponent, trying to control their big mass, flip, push them over um, to get that pancake block or whatever the case might be. So I'm not saying it's a bad exercise. It, it does put your back in a bad position in some ways. Um, but it, it does have some functionality to it. It's not like you're just lifting a weight in one specific plane. You're having to bend and twist and do some different things. So, but it's not super specific for a lot of different sports. Um, now we've got this concept of specificity of training kind of is the exact opposite of what people advocate when they talk about cross training. Um, cross training, well, we'll be a better, more resilient athlete if we can mix up what we're doing in training and challenge the body in all these different ways. Um, and if your goal is just overall general fitness, then I think cross training is great. If your goal is to be a better distance runner, a better sprinter, a better baseball player, a better dancer, the vast majority of your training should be focused on the skills that you need to do in those sports. Um, say cross training has some advantages, but it's definitely not going to be the most time efficient use um, of your effort if you really are just trying to get better at the one given sport that you're most interested in. Um, like I said, I think for kids um, growing up, I think there's huge value to being involved in multiple sports throughout the course of the year rather than being one of these one sport athletes that does year-round baseball all the time. They have their fall league, their summer league, their spring league, all these different things. Um, I think that child, especially as they're growing, would be much better served to play soccer one part of the year, play basketball one part of the year, play football one part of the year, play baseball one part of the year, whatever sports they're interested in. Um, and I think for that developing child, it's more important to not create a situation where you're developing overuse injuries by just doing one thing all the time. Um, now, the other area where trans or training can come into play is, is what specific dynamics of fitness are we trying to get better at? And, and some things will help multiple components of fitness, others won't do quite as much. Um, when they look at resistance training in particular, um, in particular if we talk about muscle strength, and muscle endurance as opposed to muscle strength and cardiovascular endurance, that's a little bit different. But we're looking at just the muscle components. If I do a lot of bench press, let's say, and I improve my strength, I go from where I can bench press 200 pounds, where I can bench press 250 pounds, um, chances are very good that my ability to do 100 pounds of bench press, I'd be able to do a whole lot more reps after getting in better shape and going from where I can max at 200 pounds versus 250 pounds. I would have good carryover, even though asking my body to only move 100 pounds in that bench press motion isn't that much of a challenge. If I can do 250, 
um, chances are good that let's say at 200 pounds, maybe I could do 25 reps with 100 pounds. Um, but if I go to 250, maybe I can do 35 reps because I have gotten some carryover, some transfer of training over that. Yes, I am much stronger. So that also does help my muscle endurance too. Now, the other side has not necessarily been shown to be as true that if I just do hundreds of push-ups every day, it, it's not going to probably cause as much of a big gain in my ability to maximally push a large bench press amount. Um, if I do 100 push-ups every day and as I get better, I do 120 the next day and then the next week I'm doing 150 and the next week I'm doing 200 that doesn't necessarily mean that my bench press ability is gonna just gradually go from 200 pounds max to 250 pounds max, because I'm not challenging it to push that heavy load. I'm challenging it to go longer and longer, but not necessarily to push harder. So um, we do see that as differences in, in how strength training plays out. If we do heavier and heavier loads, it does tend to also improve our ability to do more and more loads with a lesser amount of weight or force. Um, but the same is not true if it's the opposite dynamic. If just by doing lots of reps with a low amount of resistance doesn't necessarily make us have big gains in strength. We probably would improve some, but, but not nearly as much as we might see with the opposite setup. If we look at endurance training, um, the motions need to be really similar if we want to have good transfer of training. If we want to actually show improvements in our conditioning in one endurance activity, the movements involved need to be pretty similar. So if we look at, let's say a, a cyclist versus a swimmer, um, cycling is a leg dominant activity. Swimming is much more of an upper body dominant activity. They both may improve the heart and the cardiovascular system. So the engine gets in better shape, but the, the things that are creating the motion may not have improved that much. If all I do is cycle all the time, I might get my heart and my lungs in great shape for going for long periods of time at high intensity with my legs. But when I get in the pool, I haven't been using my arms to do that motion over and over again. And, and the likelihood is that I'm, my arms are gonna fatigue before my cardiovascular system fatigues because we haven't conditioned the arms as part of that cardiovascular training the same way we've been conditioning the legs if all we've been doing is cycling a whole lot. If we look at something like um, running and doing an elliptical, um, those motions are more similar than cycling and swimming. So we're likely to see better carryover if somebody just does the elliptical all the time because they don't want the impact because they are doing that sagittal plane back and forth motion with their leg. It, it's likely to have better carryover to help also improve their running conditioning compared to if they had been doing cycling, which is a different type of movement, a lot more bend in the knee and the hip with cycling than we see with running or an elliptical. Um, it doesn't force you through those same arcs of motion. So the arcs of motion have to be similar. The planes of motion have to be similar if we're really trying to maximize the ability to transfer of training. Now reversibility, um, that is basically the use it or lose it principle. You can see Thomas Jefferson there. I don't think he had tennis shoes, but um, so don't believe any meme that you see on the internet. That's the moral of that story, I think. Um, but reversibility is, is really, if you don't do things on a regular basis, you're gonna lose the ability to keep doing them. And we have lots of people that were great high school athletes that are no longer great athletes because they no longer continue doing those things. Coordination is one of those things that's kind of a little bit more inherent, but conditioning is, is really where we lose that reversibility. Um, you know, you can, it, coordination, when you have a given motor skill program that you've developed, you can go years without doing it a lot of times and still be able to do it. Think about riding a bike. You rode a bike a bunch as a kid, and now as an adult, you haven't ridden a bike in 15 years, but all of a sudden you can get on that bike and you can still ride that bike. The motor planning, you know how to balance, you know how to move your legs and maintain your balance, that doesn't go away. Now, how far can you ride that bike? That's a matter of conditioning. And if you're not doing it on a regular basis, you're not gonna go very far because you're gonna to fatigue too quickly. Your muscles aren't ready to, do, to go that long. Your cardiovascular system's not conditioned to do that as well. And so that applies really to all the different components of fitness. 
if we don't challenge our body to go through large arcs of motion, our range of motion will tend to diminish. If we don't challenge our body to push for long periods of time, our endurance will become diminished. If we don't lift large amounts of resistance on a regular basis, we're going to get weaker. Um, so these are these are definitely applicable to pretty much every part of fitness. If you look at um, you know muscle strength, muscle endurance, cardiovascular fitness, flexibility, all those things, um, if we don't do it on a regular basis, if we don't challenge and keep upgrading things, making it harder, that's um, that progressive overload concept, then we're not going to make gains. Now you can just kind of tread water and maintain things if we just kind of do the same stuff all the time. We won't lose it. We won't necessarily improve, but we won't lose it. Um, and so with our patients, many times we're trying to help them improve certain components of their movement, whether it's increasing their range, increasing their strength, increasing their endurance. And we do finite exercises for that. And that helps, but then we need them to put those to use in functional activities. And so we need to help figure out how do we strengthen these muscles and improve these range of motion and then have them do the tasks that actually require them to go through those big arcs of motion, like going from sitting to standing. We might work on somebody's knee range of motion. We might work on improving their quad strength, their glute strength um, in on the plinth. Um, but then we can make them go down into a low squat or put them on a low chair and have them rise up. And that's going to force them to go through large arcs of motion at the joints that we've just been working on helping their range of motion. And we're also asking them to engage the muscles that we've been strengthening in a functional way to try and maximize their ability to have that good carryover into real life activities. All right, the five drum, we kind of went over in lab um, last week. So I'm not going to spend time on that. Um, but those components are up there. Again, they're kind of extensions of what are called what's called the FIT principle, the frequency, intensity, time, and type. Just those kind of extra letters beyond the FI are components of time and type, really. Um, the Vs are more about the intensity when we look at the volume and the velocity. Um, so there's there's some extra descriptive terms in that five drum component that aren't in kind of the standard fit principle that many of you might have learned about in your undergraduate or other coursework. All right, so that's it for what we were supposed to finish last week. Um, let's talk about range of motion. And we already went through range of motion a little bit in lab, and we will do more this week. For those that are Monday lab group, um, lab one folks, I'll talk to Johnny about it. We'll probably try and carve out a little bit of time when you're here on campus on Wednesday this week to work some of this in um, within the therapeutic procedures labs that you have that day. And then we'll try and add the rest in next week and Monday in therapeutic exercise lab so we don't let you miss out on these activities. We'll try and just kind of find a way to fit them all in over the next couple of weeks to make sure that you're caught up with the, the Tuesday, Thursday group that's going to actually be able to do all these labs and have a little bit more time there. So um, range of motion, we want to talk about when we want to do certain types, what are the indications, and then what are the contraindications. And you may have already started talking about these terms a little bit in modalities because every different modality has certain indications, reasons why we do it, and certain contraindications and precautions where we absolutely don't do it is a contraindication. Precautions are, we might be able to do it, but we need to be careful when we do it. Um, and then what are we trying to achieve with the different types of range of motion, whether it's passive, active, or active assisted. All right, so functional excursion. Um, we actually had this in our lab activity last week and I talked to Johnny and neither one of us had anybody do it. Um, so we'll try and see if we can incorporate this a little bit too. Functional excursion is basically the distance in millimeters or centimeters, excuse me, centimeters would be the better distance um, from a muscle's maximally shortened position to its maximally lengthened position or vice versa. Elongate it as much as you can across all the joints, measure the distance from the O to the I have the person contract that muscle or, or passively move it into its most shortened position and then measure that distance. And so that's one way to look at range of motion besides just doing goniometric measurements. 
is really how far can that muscle lengthen and how far that can that muscle shorten. And that's really what it's all about. Um, so it is related to how much range of motion that we have at those given joints for two joint muscles, um, multi-joint muscles, ones that cross you know, both the hip and the knee, both the shoulder and the elbow, both the elbow and the wrist and the fingers, then we start having to bring into the concept of active and passive insufficiency too. Active insufficiency, as a reminder, that's the fact that a muscle that crosses more than one joint cannot move both of those joints through their maximal arc of motion at the same time. If we move one joint as far as it can go, the other one is gonna be somewhat limited because the muscle just can't shorten that much. Passive insufficiency is the opposite. That's really more of a stretching kind of thing, and, but it's the same idea. If I elongate a muscle across a joint as much as possible, then the other joint that that muscle crosses cannot move as much as it might be able to. Um, and then soft tissue approximation can certainly come into play with both limiting range of motion as well as limiting that functional excursion. So we'll, since I'm recording this, we're not doing the activity, but we'll try and um, work some of those in during lab today, at least for this week, for give you a chance to measure a couple different muscles and see what their functional excursion is. All right, so we just talked about active and passive insufficiency, and hopefully you remember that from um, kinesiology from last semester as well. All right, so we did talk about these terms in lab last week. Passive, meaning the movement is being caused by an external force. We don't want the person to activate their muscles to cause that motion. We can move the person. A machine can move the person, like a CPM. We can have the patient move their own body part by grasping the other limb and moving it, or by using something like a pulley, or using towels or straps or things like that so they can control the limb. But the key thing is, is that we're not having them actively contract the muscles to cause the motion that we're wanting to occur. Um, active range, just opposite. We do want them to use their muscles to cause that motion to occur. Um, and then active assistive, um, we want the person to go through as big of arc of motion actively as they can. And then we're gonna help them. They are gonna help themselves. Some implement's gonna help them go through a bigger arc of motion, the key being we still want them to try to keep actively moving it, use the muscles that do that action as much as they can, and use some other force to help complete that arc of motion. And that's going to gradually hopefully help them regain the ability to actively move that joint through its full range without having to assist it. So it is kind of a progressive step when people are weak, um, that we're trying to help them remember how to use those muscles and, and get the muscles firing and working through the full arc of motion that they're capable of moving the, the joint, the body part through. So we have different reasons why we would do each of those types. Um, with passive range, the most common time that we will do passive range is right after an injury, right after a surgery. Um, we want some motion um, but we don't necessarily want the tissues that are injured to have to perform that motion. Um, if they've done it, I've mentioned in my lab groups, you know, rotator cuff surgery is one of the more common things when we might see a lot of passive range of motion done because it is somewhat of a delicate surgery where they have to anchor back down the muscle that's become detached usually from the insertion on the head of the humerus. And if we make those muscles contract too early, then they can basically kind of pull the anchor loose or elongate some of those tissues and kind of damage the repair that has been done. So that's a super common reason for doing passive. Um, if we look down below, we've got our primary goals of passive. Not moving is a bad thing. If you remember from pathology, I gave you that phrase, motion is lotion. And, and that's true whether it's active motion or passive motion, just moving the joint, moving the muscles, Moving the tissues helps minimize um, fibrotic formation. Basically, extra collagen um, that the fibroblasts are producing can create kind of linkages, it's believed, between different layers of tissues that then make it harder to move those tissues. And so if we move things on a regular basis, we don't give those 
identified broad connections a chance to develop. We're kind of nipping them in the bud before they get bad. Um, synovial movement, synovial fluid movement is a big reason for doing passive range. We want to move the joint so that the synovial fluid inside of that joint capsule has a chance to kind of circulate back and forth. Um, it does help, it is believed to kind of help promote and, and the, keep the articular cartilage at the ends of the joints help, healthier. It's gonna, if you have joints that have fibrocartilage like menisci and, and um, labrums and things like that, then it tends to help those as well because they just don't have a good blood supply internally um, and they do get rid of some of their waste and through the synovial fluid and the synovial fluid does help, it's believed, deliver some oxygen and things like that that can help keep those tissues a little bit healthier too. So we do want to keep things moving. Um, it will help if we do passive range of motion with both general circulation um, as well as lymphatic circulation. And it probably does a little bit more for lymphatic circulation than the general circulation. Again, if we are actively contracting things, then that's going to increase a bigger stimulus in blood flow to the area because the muscles are doing the work and they need fuel in the form of oxygen and glucose and they're producing waste that they need to get rid of. If we're just moving things passively, it, it will help with circulation to a degree because we get that muscle pump action. If you think about the valves and the veins and how they work, we need the assistance of movement to kind of help squeeze some of that blood um, up past the valves and get it back to our heart. But that tugging on the skin as the joints and tissues move through a bigger arc of motion is gonna also help the lymphatic vessels kind of open up and be able to pick back up some of the lymphatic fluid that may have settled into a, an edematous joint. Um, so it does help with that. Many times it helps the patient get over guarding and it just pain if we can gradually start moving things. And a lot of times when you're doing passive range of motion, you start out in a very limited range of motion. Um, and as they have less pain, then you can move through progressively bigger and bigger arcs of motion. A lot of times with passive range, we may also not be going to end range. If we look at like knee flexion, where we say, oh, that person can go from you know, normal knee flexion, let's say zero to 130, 140 degrees, whatever we're gonna say it is. Um, they might have pain at full extension and they might have a lot of pain at full flexion, but they might feel okay in the middle. So maybe we're doing passive range of motion where their knee is bending from 40 degrees to 90 degrees and we go back and forth in there. Well, that movement is still gonna help with moving that synovial fluid. It's gonna help with some of the lymphatic um, circulatory assistance and things like that. It may not improve the motion so much at the ends of the range because we're not challenging that, but it still can help us work towards that goal by, by just getting things moving a little bit. Um, it definitely can help with improving kinesthetic awareness, especially for those patients that have had surgery um, where they cut through the skin to get at a joint to do a joint replacement, an ACL, whatever it is, you'll often end up with some numb areas in the skin um, and the joint capsule where the nerve endings have been cut and you're losing some of that sensory feedback. And so moving it and having the patient watch while it's moving helps kind of reestablish some of those connections and helps them better understand where their leg is in space moving forward and, and can help kind of, it's believed to help kind of facilitate returning of coordination and things like that, that really require that sensory feedback to be accurate. So a lot of different benefits from passive range. It is more of a workout for us than the patient, but it definitely has a lot of good benefits for the patient um, in many ways, especially early on. Um, in the rehab process. Because it's passive, you're not asking the muscle to contract. It's not going to do anything to hold on to muscle mass. It's not going to do anything to improve the conditioning of the muscle. It's really just about movement. And again, if we make somebody do active range, that's going to do more to stimulate blood flow because of the physiological changes that are occurring in the muscle that's performing the motion. Um, so we don't get any of those benefits from doing passive range. So it's not going to improve strength. It's not going to improve endurance. It's not going to improve really functional ability, but it's an earlier step. If we get the motion back, then we can start getting the strength back. 
then we're going to be able to improve function. Um, but that's pretty typical progression with most musculoskeletal injuries is to get movement back before we start worrying about getting strength back. Um, once we get the motion, then we can think about adding in some challenge to it to help better condition the muscle to improve strength or endurance or power, whatever component we're, we're after. All right, so active and active assistive. Um, we are trying to, we can do it for different things. So we had a few cases last week in lab that we looked at. One of them was the person that had the piano key deformity where they had the acromioclavicular separation and we didn't really want to move the shoulder joint because it's not a stable joint. We've got this big ligamentous disruption, but we don't want to just let the whole rest of the arm sit there and do nothing. So we wanted to you to understand that we definitely want to actively move the fingers, the wrists, the elbow. The elbow gets a little bit trickier because biceps and triceps are both going to cross the shoulder joint. Um, so we may not actively try to have those muscles do a whole lot, but we would still potentially benefit from some, some passive with the shoulder muscles, um, biceps, triceps, that we definitely would want to do active with pronators, supinators, wrist flexors, wrist extensors, all the finger motions that we can do. Um, active range can help with improving aerobic conditioning to a degree, depending on how much challenge we're giving the person. And if you think about like being on a bike, if somebody's had knee surgery, um, it forces your knee to go through a big arc of motion, especially if you have the seat down really low where the person is forced into a lot of knee flexion when the pedal comes up high to the top of that, that circular motion. If we add a little bit of resistance to that bike, then we're gonna get kind of a two for one. We'll help improve the aerobic conditioning for the person as well as improving the range of motion. If we decrease the resistance, so there's like no friction um, and they're just freely spinning, then it's more about the range of motion, that cycling motion, um, than it would be about really helping them get in better condition in any way. Um, active range definitely is good to help when we have been sitting. We talked about posture in, in uh, therapeutic procedures last week. And so, you know, standing up, moving in the opposite direction. So we've been in this sitting position where our hips are very flexed 90 degrees. We want to stand up and get into a lunge position so that we can alternately stretch out each leg's hip, ex hip flexor muscles um, so they don't get too tight um, from sitting for a long period of time. Um, same thing with like doing scapular retraction. If we've been typing on the keyboard and we have our arms forward all the time, we want to do some active range to kind of work on scapular retraction so that we don't um, allow our body to get stuck in these kind of poor posture positions. If the person is really weak, um, those neurological injuries or somebody recovering from a surgery, then active range can be a strengthening activity. Um, we can if their muscle strength is below a grade three, if they're a one or a two, just having them perform active range through progressively larger and larger arcs of motion will help them build their strength back up to a level of a three potentially, because we're not adding any extra load with any of these range of motion activities. If you already have strength that lets you complete that full arc of motion against gravity to get that three grade, active range isn't going to make it any better. There's no overload. Um, we talk about that overload principle. So there's not, that's not going to happen with that. We get some of the same effects that we see with passive range in helping with proprioception and helping with kinesthetic awareness. A little bit more so in the muscles in particular with active range, since they're the ones generating forces and feeling tensions and things like that. Compared to passive range, we might be just getting more like joint capsule receptors, skin receptors might be sending some information, but it would be less about what the muscles are telling us um, with passive range compared to active range. Um, can develop some coordination. Again, if we're looking at those neurologically involved patients that are just having a hard time figuring out how to move their limb after their um, you know, lesion in the brain or, or severing a nerve or compressing a nerve or whatever. Um, and so that can be helpful too. Um, preventing deep vein thrombosis, we would get that benefit from passive as well as active. 
um, active, probably a little bit more so again because we're stimulating more directly the blood circulation as opposed to just the lymphatic circulation when we look at that. So contraindications with any of these types of range of motion, um, if we have an unstable situation, we don't want to move it. Um, if somebody just broke something, we don't want to move that bone or really the joints on either side of it. We don't tend to want to move a whole lot because usually the muscles are that move the more distal joint or the more proximal joint often cross or attach to the bone that is fractured. And so if we move that ankle, let's say, and our tibia is fractured, well, all those dorsiflexor and plantar flexors are pretty much coming off of the tibia or the fibula, and that might be problematic because it might pull on that bone where the fracture is trying to heal, causing it to separate, not heal the way we want it, causing non-union, things like that. So those are really the kind of the key things when we don't want to do motion. Um, we talked about infection. If somebody does have an active blood clot, then those are other reasons why we don't want to do range of motion. And that's kind of where this patient condition is life-threatening. If we break off a clot from a DVT and it lodges in the lungs and causes a pulmonary embolus, we could potentially kill that person. Um, if they do have an active infection going on, then we have the potential to spread that infection by promoting blood flow and circulation in that area. And it might go elsewhere in the body and cause other complications. If we have, if you remember from pathology, towards the end of last semester, I showed all the different lines and tubes. If somebody has um, you know, an IV line in the wrist, then we may not do wrist flexion and extension on that hand because we don't want it to run the risk of pulling that IV line out. Or if they have an arterial line, even more important, we don't want to pull that line out either. So there are exceptions and, and reasons why we need to think about would it be a good thing to move that body part? Would it not be a good thing to move that body part? Um, and maybe it's okay to move it in a limited arc of motion, but not through a full arc of motion. Um, so there are a lot of things that are kind of precaution based, um, but the ones that are definitely contraindications are kind of those things in that top um, little bullet point there. And certainly the anything that's life threatening, well, you should think that's a contraindication. We don't wanna put them at risk of dying. Um, safety. Um, so we need to think about not only the patient's safety, but also our safety. Now this woman here is helping this person with some hip extension, it appears. Not a great posture for her. It would be far better if that person was up on a plinth where she could be standing up and not so bent over. Um, she does have herself in a good base of support. Looks like her spine is staying fairly straight. She's not really all curled up to do it but at the same time, it's not a great position for us to be in um, for that. We do really have to think about the proper placement of our hands um, when we're moving, especially an injured body part for a patient, somebody that has pain because they've had a fracture, a sprain, a surgery. If you don't support the patient in the correct place, you can make them either extend the joint more than is comfortable or flex the joint more than is comfortable. Um, and if we do that because we mishandled the patient, they're not gonna like us very much because we just made them hurt a whole lot and they're gonna be less likely to do what we ask them to do moving forward. So you wanna know how to handle patients. Um, and this is true when you're helping them get up out of bed as well as helping do range of motion activities. Always think about whatever joint we're trying to do range of motion with, try and support both the proximal bone and the distal bone. That way you kind of can control both of those segments and we're not forcing the joint farther than it wants to go. So let's say I have a patient that had a knee replacement and they're okay kind of moving in the middle range. I'm comfortable from 30 to 60 degrees, but if I bend it more than 60 degrees, it hurts. If I try and straighten it more than 30 degrees, it hurts. Now, if I just reach under and I grab like by their Achilles and kind of pick up their leg without also picking up their femur, then it's gonna force their tibia up and it's gonna force their knee into more extension. And they're not gonna, they're gonna hurt when I do that. If I go to help them and I just pick up underneath, you know, like under the back of the knee or the distal portion of the femur and I lift up there, well, gravity is gonna make the tibia come down and now I'm forcing them into more flexion and that's not gonna feel good. 
Um, you need to think about where they have the most edema, where their incisions might be, where their fractures are. Um, and, and sometimes the what we think of as the optimal hand placement, we may have to change depending on what they've got. They've got a wound, they've got sutures in place, they've got external fixator in place. Um, so we do kind of have to think about that type of thing. Um, in just a sec, we'll see a slide of a CPM, um, a continuous passive motion is what CPM stands for. And that's a machine that used to be used pretty commonly to do knee range of motion on patients that had like ACL surgeries and, and knee replacements and things like that. Um, when we're getting that patient into the device like that, we need to really understand how to support the weight of that limb so that we don't force it into uncomfortable positions. Again, we don't want to break the trust that, the, that we're trying to create with the patient by causing them more pain than we should. It's not that what, everything that we do is pain-free, <clears throat> but we don't want to cause them unnecessary pain if it could have been avoided if we handled them in a better way. And we'll kind of talk about that in, in lab as we go through these different techniques. Um, so we've got this term functional range of motion. And, and sometimes when you look at an evaluation or an assessment of a patient, you'll see a couple different terms related to either range of motion or strength. And one of them is WNL, that's within normal limits. Another one is WFL, that's within functional limits. WFL is generally gonna be less than WNL. So if we think about shoulder motion, to go into shoulder flexion within normal limits is if somebody can get up to say 170 degrees. That's pretty close to what we expect, 170, 180, maybe a little over 180. Those would be considered normal range of motion. Now there's a lot of times where we don't, it's pretty rare that we actually need to go all the way up into 180 degrees of shoulder flexion. Um, but if I'm trying to put my dishes away from the dishwasher, I might need to go up to 120 or 130 degrees of shoulder flexion to get those dishes up onto that shelf, depending on how tall you are. So that's more of a functional range. They can't go to 180, but they can go to 140. So they can at least comb their hair, brush their teeth, bring food to their mouth, hang their clothes up in the closet, get things off of counters start, and, and shelves and things like that. So those are functional range. If we think about lower extremity, you know, normal range for the knee, we want to go through, let's say 140 degrees of flexion or something in that ballpark. Um, we don't really need that much range to get up from a chair. We only need about 90 degrees. We don't need that range of motion to climb steps. Um, we only need about 90 degrees or so for that too. So functional range for the knee is significantly less than maximal, what we think of as normal range um, with that. So those are kind of ways to differentiate if it's functional range, it's allowing us to accomplish these ADLs, IADL tasks that we need to do in the course of our life Normal range is what we want to give the person the best success at any task that we might be faced with, that we've gotten them back to what the joint's supposed to move, how far the muscle's supposed to go. Um, so WNL is more than WFL. All right, um, these case studies are really just the ones that we did in lab last week. So I'm gonna just close this set of slides down and we'll move into um, stretching for our last little component on this recording. Um, Booker T. Washington. I think Rodri, our former instructor for this class, put all these inspirational quotes at the start of these slides and I like them, so I left them. Hopefully you feel fired up after reading some of those things. All right, so stretching, different than range of motion. With stretching, we're gonna have a distinct pause at the end of the available range of motion. And the goal is different than range of motion. Range of motion is just about helping things move a little bit um, for those circulatory benefits, for those joint health benefits, things like that, decreasing pain. The goal of stretching is to increase the available range of motion um, or to decrease the tone in a muscle so that we can use it better. So, some definitely distinct differences, try and overcome long-term tightness in muscles and things like that, and, and the surrounding connective tissues and, and the joints itself. 
So we'll kind of look at some different types of stretches some different ways to stretch. And then again in lab um, over the next week or two, we'll kind of try and incorporate all of these and give you some idea to how to apply them both to yourself as well as doing them with a patient, instructing the patient, or if we're doing the stretch on the patient, what we should be feeling um, as we take them through these motions and help them improve their, their flexibility. All right, so stretching. Therapeutic maneuver designed to increase mobility of soft tissues and improve range of motion, trying to lengthen, shorten structures. And we got the little fox right there doing his downward dog, which is kind of strange because he's a fox, not a dog. If you have pets, a lot of times you'll see when they get up from lying down, they do a downward dog and then they do an upper dog. They're stretching their in their legs, they're stretching their flexors, and they're stretching their extensors. Um, and that's just instinctive. And many of us do the same thing. We get out of bed and we stretch our arms overhead and arch our back and, and lengthen out. So those are things that we just, it feels good. It helps move things and, and does keep us from developing restrictions and tightness. Um, flexibility can be enhanced through stretching. Um, and so flexibility is the ability to move a single joint or multiple joints through pain-free unrestricted movement. And the muscles can certainly limit that. Um, the tendon can certainly limit that. The actual joint itself, if we have restrictions in the glide spin roll in a, at the arthrokinematic level, that can cause restrictions. Um, large girths can cause restrictions if we have just a whole lot of body fat or a whole lot of swelling in a joint, then that can certainly affect how far we can move something to. Um, hypomobility is that lack of flexibility, essentially. We've lost range of motion. We've lost the ability to move through that large arc of motion that those body tissues are designed to do. And many times it's because the tissue itself gets shortened. Um, we develop those fibrotic adhesions that make it hard for those tissues to glide and move past each other and it restricts the motion itself. So this person here has a has contractures um, likely in the elbows and the fingers probably somebody that had um, a lot of neurological tone um, from like a brain injury potentially. Um, that's a fairly common thing that we'll see because it's bilateral, I would say it's probably not a stroke. With a stroke, you might see this unilaterally. This would be more what we would typically see with somebody that had a brain injury. Um, I think that yellow up there, at first I was like, is that like a wig? I think it's just some pillow that's yellow. I thought it was like a Ronald McDonald wig or something like that in yellow. So a contracture is different than a contraction. A contraction is an active process where we're trying to engage muscles to make them fire to cause a given motion. A contracture is that adaptive shortening. Um, we get tightness and then we lose the ability to fully extend those muscles if we do not take those muscles through that big arc of motion on a regular basis. So this individual here, they could have just a lot of high neurological tone that's causing spasticity in their muscles, that's making their elbows bend to such a great degree, making their wrists and fingers go into flexion like that. And if that's the case, if we can decrease their tone, we can increase that range of motion. The problem when it's like a brain injury type thing is that that's like 24 seven that they're not able to inhibit that high level of muscle activity. And so it becomes pretty hard to break somebody out of that. Um, we do see a lot of contractures that also develop when people sit all the time or if they lie in a given position all the time. Um, really common for people to get a contracture in their calf muscles and their Achilles when they lay on their back all the time. Instead of our foot being held at a 90 degree angle like it might be when we're standing upright, the weight of the covers tends to pull the toes in the forefoot down towards the the bed surface. And if that person stays in that position for long periods of time, the muscles and tendons on the back of the joint, those calf muscles and that Achilles get really, really tight. And then that person starts losing the ability to pull their toes up, to pull their forefoot up, and they can no longer get their foot flat on the ground and, and have their tibia vertical um, to weight bear effectively. So contractures are never a good thing. 
we see a lot of problems with hip flexion contractures and knee flexion contractures when people sit all the time. If you think about sitting in like a kitchen chair, you're sitting and you're at 90 degrees bend at the hip, you're at 90 degree bend at the knee. And when we have patients that stay in wheelchairs all day long because they can't really walk safely, they're gonna get those contractures. And so we need to get them prone, let's say, to get their hip extended. Um, we need to try and, the other advantage of being prone that it makes gravity wanna pull the tibia down. Um, and that helps to lengthen out some of the knee flexion contractures too. But once a contracture sets in, it's very, very hard to get rid of. It's far easier to avoid it in the first place if we can. Um, and so we do see contracture issues a lot with neurological patients, a lot of people that are just weak. Um, but we also see it with like patients that have had amputations. Um, we want them to keep the knee really straight. We want them to keep the ability to extend the hip because they're gonna be sitting for a period of time until their leg that was cut off, um, the residual limb matures and kind of shrinks down to the point where we can put an artificial prosthetic on. They usually wait a few months after the surgery before somebody gets a prosthetic. And if that patient's not really good about lengthening those tissues that are prone to get contractures, then they're gonna have a really hard time adapting and walking with the prosthetic because now they can't straighten their knee or their hip is always flexed. Uh, it's really hard to walk that way if you have those contractures developing. So we always wanna try and help people avoid it if we can. Um, sometimes it's kind of ine inevitable and we're just trying to limit the extent of it. Um, but it can be, let's say neurologically based or it can just be lack of motion based, kind of holding given postures for long periods of time. Both of those can cause contractures. And we usually do talk about the position that they're stuck in. So a hip flex contracture is what somebody that is stuck in sitting all the time is. When they stand up, they can no longer extend the hip. It's stuck in flexion. Um, here's a, what's called a fibrotic contracture. Um, this child looks to be, um, has like a probably feeding tube, maybe a ventilator in. They've got the child's head turned to the side. And if you're constantly turned to one side, then that sternocleidomastoid on the side that's up, like in this case on the right side, is going to be in a shortened position. Um, sternocleidomastoid causes rotation to the opposite side, causes the head to turn to the opposite side. Um, and so if we're in that position for hours on end for a medical reason like this, it gets really tight. And I'm sure there's a lot of COVID patients that were on ventilators that have contractures like this. They, put, they found that putting those patients in prone really helped a lot with oxygenation in the lungs. But if you're prone to get a breathing tube down you, you've got to have your head turned to one side or turned to the other side. And so they're spending hours in prone with their head cranked one way, they're very likely to have developed lots of contractures. And they probably, as a course of good practice, they probably do need to periodically turn them the opposite way, put the ventilator on the opposite side of the bed, crank the head the other way so that we get a more symmetrical limitation instead of just having it always turn to the right or always turn to the left. Um, this is a condition when in kids, when we see it in particular, we'll call it torticollis, different than tortellini. We eat tortellini, that's pasta. Torticollis is just a medical term for that tight sternocleidomastoid, really, that causes the head to be crooked relative to the trunk or turn. All right, so why do we want to stretch? Um, we want to try and do a lot of the same things that we're looking at with range of motion activity. Break up adhesions, try and limit contractures, try and if we have scar tissue that's forming, we want that scar tissue to become pliable and easily to lengthen. This is a huge one post-operatively. It's a huge one with like burn patients that have a lot of their body skin that has been lost. Um, when we have burns or surgical incisions that cross joints, if those scars do not stay supple and mobile, then it's gonna affect the ability of the joint to move. Um, there's too much tension on the, on the skin itself. And so it doesn't matter if the muscle's warm enough, if the skin's too tight, the joint's not gonna move very far. Um, as we bend a joint, that skin gets stretched across the top of that joint and, and we need to have the ability for that tissue to lengthen. So um, stretching can kind of help 
with all those things, again, as does range of motion, but we'll talk about how stretching is different and how it actually can have a better chance of truly lengthening tissue than, than range of motion. Because range of motion, we're just taking through that motion and then immediately reversing the direction. We're not really holding it at all. And we really kind of need to hold things to get any kind of true lengthening. So we're trying to help limit deformities. Um, there's a, been a lot of um, talk about whether stretching is good to do before exercise or not. Um, most of the more recent research really doesn't think that it does a lot for preventing injury by stretching ahead of time, at least what we think of as classic static stretching, where we hold a given stretch for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. Um, it, it doesn't really play out that it helps with injury prevention. It actually can kind of help with force production or interfere with force production a little bit. So I think what we call dynamic stretching which is really more similar to range of motion, to be honest, um, can be helpful um, to prepare the body for activity. If we force it to go through big arcs of motion before we are gonna do those arcs of motion in our sport, then that makes sense. But to just lean into a stretch and hold it for 30 seconds before we go run out onto the field hasn't really been shown to be super helpful. Um, better to do chronic stretching meaning stretching when you're not about to do the activity, but stretching on a very regular basis. If we're truly trying to make gains in our flexibility and in our ability to move through large arcs of motion, then we need it to be a lot more regular. Acute stretching would be more of that right before I'm gonna do the activity, I'm gonna stretch. Um, and again, there's not a ton of research that says that that really helps with injury prevention. So I generally don't stretch before I, I run. Um, I might stretch a little bit afterwards. Um, I probably should stretch more afterwards, but I, I generally just start slow to let the blood get flowing and then start speeding up to be my warm up. Um, but dynamic activities, if you if you've done like warm up drills, high knees, butt kicks, leg swings, if you've ever watched like swimmers on the starting blocks and they flap their arms back and forth, those are kind of more the range of motion type stretches, dynamic stretches. You're about to take your joints through big arcs of motion in your activity. You do want to do that beforehand so that when you first hit that water or you first hit that field, you're not just totally cold and the muscles have not been challenged to go through that bigger arc of motion. And if the weather is colder, I think that type of stuff is a little bit more important. We want the muscle to be warm internally um, by using it by doing some light jogging, by doing some cycling, by doing some um, movements with our arms on a regular basis um, to get that blood flowing. If the muscles warm up, it's less susceptible to injury. Um, and by warmed up, it's the tissue temperature is higher. And the way we do that is by making it contract at least at a low level so that we generate some heat. Um, that's gonna do a lot more to prevent injury than just doing a static stretch. All right, so there are definitely are reasons when we do not stretch. Um, a bony block, if you know you think somebody should have, let's say they should be able to get their elbow totally straight and you get it out and they're you're trying to lengthen it out and they stop at 30 degrees of flexion and it's a very hard end feel, there's no point in stretching. It's that the, something in the bone itself is wrong. The olecranon is at the wrong angle for the fossa and it's jamming into the bone trying to stretch it further is not gonna change anything. If it's bone on bone, it can't really go any further without just hurting the person. And it's not really gonna move any further because you're not gonna bend the bone by stretching it. So anytime I have a bony block, we're not gonna put extra force through that and try and force it. It's, it's pointless and just causing pain. Similar to range of motion, if we've got a fracture that's not stable enough to move, then we don't wanna stretch that body part. Similar to range of motion, if we've got acute inflammation infection, we don't really want to move that body part much. Um, sharp pain, that's generally a big warning sign. If you're just achy, that's okay to move. But if it's like you move and you're just like, ah, like a stabbing, shooting, burning type pain, we don't want to move it. It's not ready yet. That's the body telling us it's not ready yet. Um, hematoma basically a large amount of bruising or bleeding underneath the tissue. Um, we don't really wanna move that a whole lot. Um, 
it's especially to end range. If we've got a muscle pull, let's say I pulled my hamstring and had a big hematoma, all this bruising on the back of my leg from that muscle strain, the, the tissues that caused that hematoma to bleed and develop were recently torn and damaged. And if we try and excursion, take them through a big excursion and put force through them, the likelihood that we're going to make that clot that has formed to try to close off the capillaries to quit bleeding, we're going to dislodge it, we're going to interrupt it, we're going to potentially cause it to bleed more and might make it worse. To do a little bit of movement, range of motion would be more appropriate for hematoma, at least in that mid-range arc of motion, as opposed to the ends of arc of motion where we can cause more tension through the tissues. That's a better way to try and help the body kind of rid itself of some of those dead blood cells that are lingering there without putting too much stress through those delicate tissues that were just injured. Um, if you're already hypermobile, well, why do you want to stretch more? If you need it for your sport, you're a dancer, you're a gymnast, then it can make some sense to become even more hypermobile if it's going to make you be able to move more fluidly and get higher scores from the judges or be able to execute certain dance skills that you need to for this routine or whatever the case might be. Those are kind of the exceptions to the rule. But for the most part, once people get to the expected normal range of motion for their joint, we start introducing instability into the joint if we start promoting too much hypermobility and that leads to other problems. Um, and then the last one, hypermobility is desired. Um, we had one of those cases that we went over last week in lab that had the spinal cord injured patient. And I know in, in my groups, we talked about, we wouldn't necessarily want to work on improving the flexibility of the, of the finger flexor muscles because that person might need to employ that tenodesis grip where they go into wrist extension and then the passive insufficiency um, of the finger flexors causes them to close with that to be able to have a grasp and that's kind of what we're showing down below with somebody that needs that strap to hold their implement if we want them to have a better functional grasp we may not want to stretch those finger flexors and make it harder for them to come together and hold on to something similarly with that spinal cord injured patient if they're having a really hard time engaging their core muscles to sit upright, it might be beneficial for them to get tight in their torso. So that way their connective tissue can hold them in a better upright posture and they're not having to rely on muscle strength that they don't have because they can't engage those muscles. So in some of those are kind of the rare exceptions, um, but in certain patient populations, there's definitely times where we don't want them to move too much beneficial to be tight. All right, so let's look at kind of internally what's going on with the muscles um, and, and what happens when we stretch something. Um, we've got elasticity, we've got viscoelasticity, and we've got plasticity. And so elasticity is just like a rubber band. We lengthen it out and then we let go of the ends of the rubber band and it snaps back to where it was before. Um, and that's what our actin and myosin filaments do essentially. They have a lot of elasticity to them. Um, we have different extra protein fibers in, in our connective tissues, but also in the muscle itself that give it that property. Um, that term viscoelasticity is more about the different connective tissue layers. And we're looking at tendons, ligaments, fascia, and then the little bundles that surround individual muscles themselves, the endomecium, perimecium, and epimecium. Those are all non-contractile tissues. The actin and myosin is what contracts in the muscle. Everything else is kind of supporting it, bundling it, binding things together. Those tissues have much higher amounts of collagen, and that collagen is typically located within the, what they call the ground substance. And so the ground substance is usually kind of more of a gelatinous matrix that some of these protein fibers are embedded in. And viscous is a term that hopefully you know, if, you know, if we look at water versus a gel, water is less viscous than a gel. Gel is a, like a denser tissue, denser fluid. It's still fluid, you can still pour it, things like that but it takes more force, it moves more slowly. And that's kind of what they think of as how the 
collagen fibers are embedded in the ground substance. It has more of this viscoelasticity to it. It will lengthen, but it takes longer to lengthen than muscle that has much more elastic properties to it. So we need to apply the resistance and the stretch through the tissues slowly and kind of hold it there. And over time, then the viscoelastic properties of those connective tissues will let it, those fibers kind of shift and start beginning to lengthen and separate and elongate a little bit. If we hold it for a really long time, then we can get kind of a permanent change and that's called plasticity. Um, and so if we, let's say we hold the stretch for 30 seconds, we might be just starting to get some of that viscoelastic give in the connective tissues but then we're gonna back off that stretch after 30 seconds. We really haven't made any kind of permanent change. If we put a person that's tight in a position where they're gonna stay for 10 minutes, then the chances that we actually got some plastic gains is much better. Plastic just means change. Um, heard that term plastic surgery. You're doing a change to the tissue. Um, neuroplasticity, that's the ability of the brain to adapt and change after an injury or when we learn a new skill. Um, so that's, that's plasticity, it just means change. And so with stretching, we do need to typically hold things a pretty long period of time. Um, and how long we hold it depends on how intense the stretch is, how much are we pushing it, how much force is being involved um, in those things. But it, it's usually most helpful to hold things for a long period of time if we truly want to make some change in that tissue length, like minutes to or longer even. So when we look at um, muscle tissue itself, the things that contract are really just the actin and myosin that are part of those sarcomeres. Um, and again, the sarcomeres are the smallest functional unit of the cell. If you remember, we've got the Z discs or Z lines that are kind of the ends of each sarcomere and then those actinomyosin filaments kind of fill in the middle and move closer to each other. Sarcomeres are set up in muscles in series, meaning one right after the other, um, like links of a chain that are just connected one right after the other. And, and the thought on muscle tissue length is that when we do stretch it regularly on long, you know, for long enough periods of time to help it recognize that, hey, this is, I need to get longer. This person keeps trying to make me get into these really elongated positions. And the way the muscle is believed to adapt is by it adds on more sarcomeres. So the muscle itself, the contractile part of the muscle gets a little bit longer over time. And then that helps us be able to actively move that muscle through a larger arc of motion. Um, and so that can be a, a, a positive change if that's the goal. Um, the non-contractile elements, those are going to be those fascial layers, um, the skin, connective tissue. Um, if we take away our skin, we've got our subcutaneous tissue. Take away the subcutaneous tissue, we usually have what's called a superficial fascia, and then we have a deep fascia. And then below the deep fascia, we're going to have the um, we're going to have the epimysium and then the paramecium and then the endomecium that are surrounding those progressively smaller bundles of um, myofibrils, myofilaments, and individual muscle fibers. Um, and those are mostly collagen. And that's where it's believed that most of the adhesions take place. Adhesions are usually caused by fibroblasts that generate new collagen fibers. And so when we are trying to help overcome a contracture, we need to break apart those adhesions that may have formed in that connective tissue from being stuck in that position for a long period of time that caused the contracture in the first place. So it's, it's a lot easier to stretch the actual contractile part of the muscle than it is to stretch things that have way more collagen, um, like tendons, ligaments, joint capsules, fascia, things like that. So our collagen is really about giving the tissue strength. Um, we are going to have some elastin in those connective tissues, but compared to the contractile part of the muscle, it's a lesser percentage. And then we have reticulin, and these are more thin kind of connective fibers. They're not as strong as collagen. They're definitely thought to be easier to kind of break 
but those are our three primary protein fibers that we see in connective tissues, um, soft tissue, connective tissues um, like tendons and ligaments, collagen, elastin, and reticulin. They're all different types of proteins. And then I mentioned that ground substance earlier. That's basically the interstitial space um, that all these other fiber types, these proteins are embedded in. And this is what we when we talk about the viscoelastic properties of tissues, that's kind of what we're mentioning. The gelatinous material that houses all these fibers takes a little bit of time and patience to lengthen. Um, in addition to just kind of water, we're going to have what are called proteoglycans and glycoproteins. These are just different types of molecules that help create that gelatinous material. Um, and these do take kind of a longer amount of force to being applied to cause them to actually change shape and start to, to lengthen a little bit. All right, other things to consider with stretching. We have um, our two primary neuro, nervous system mechanisms in muscles that help protect them. And we have the muscle spindle and then we have the Golgi tendon organ. The muscle spindle is going to cause a contraction, reflexive contraction of the muscle if that muscle is rapidly lengthened. And so if we're trying to help somebody stretch and improve the length of that muscle, we don't want to do, we don't want to activate the muscle spindle because it's going to cause contraction of that muscle. And we're trying to get it to relax and lengthen. So slowly applied forces will tend to not stimulate the muscle spindle and will get more benefit in lengthening that muscle. So we try and kind of minimize muscle spindle contraction if the goal is true muscle lengthening. Now, when we're getting ready to do a warm-up activity for a sport, and I mentioned doing things like high knees and butt kicks and leg swings and things like that, that actually will stimulate the muscle spindle. And it's believed to kind of be helping to keep the muscle calibrated to handle the challenges of the sport that you're about to do. And that's where they believe that prolonged static stretching before a sport isn't really helpful because it kind of resets the sensitivity of the muscle spindle. And then when we are trying to cut and zig and zag on the field, we are putting these quick force stretches through the muscle. And if it's become the spindle has kind of changed its calibration to be less reactive to those quick stretches, then it's less able to generate force rapidly when we need it. And so that's kind of what the finding is and the kind of consensus is about why static stretching before dynamic sport activity is probably not the best idea. It's probably going to be more counterproductive than it is helpful um, from a performance standpoint. Um, the Golgi tendon organ is the other protective mechanism that we have in the muscle. And it works just the opposite. When we have a large amount of tension being put through the muscle, either because it's contracting very vigorously or we're leaning into a stretch and putting a lot of force through it, it doesn't want the muscle to tear. And so its reflexive mechanism is to tell the muscle to relax and decrease the amount of tone and tension in the muscle. And that will help it lengthen. And we call that autogenic inhibition. Um, the muscle is inhibiting itself. Genesis, kind of the origin, and then auto, it's self-regulating itself. So it's inhibiting itself. And we'll talk about PNF stretching in just a little bit. Um, and that's kind of one of the key principles for why people think PNF stretching is particularly effective because it does target that GTO, we're trying to get some autogenic inhibition um, to try and decrease it. There are some other PNF stretches that actually try and address reciprocal inhibition, and we'll talk about that um, here in just a sec, too. All right, like right now. So autogenic inhibition, um, if I'm trying to lengthen a muscle, and I lean into that stretch really hard. Let's say I'm stretching my hamstrings and I'm leaning forward at the waist. I've got my leg up on something. As I continue to lean into that, it's gonna basically say, yeah, there's too much tension. I'm scared it's gonna tear if I hold this position. So my, our nervous system will essentially inhibit the amount of contraction 
at rest, that tone, and the muscle will gradually lengthen out so that it doesn't become injured. Reciprocal inhibition means that the opposite muscle, when it has a stretch put through it, will tell the paired muscle on the opposite side of the joint to go ahead and relax. And, and this is a helpful thing with any kind of dynamic movement that we're doing. Um, if you think about, like, say, somebody trying to um, kick a football, um, they're going to punt the football. They're going to cock their leg back. And as they cock their leg back, you're putting a big stretch through the hip flexors, through the knee extensors, because um, I've got my knee bent and my leg back behind me. By having that big stretch through those muscles, those are the muscles that are the agonists that are need to accelerate that leg forward so it can strike the ball. And in order for me to accelerate that leg forward to strike the ball most effectively, I don't want my glutes and my hamstrings to also have a lot of tone in them because then it's going to slow that forward motion down. Because if my glutes are active, they're trying to, they do hip extension and I'm trying to do hip flexion as I accelerate my leg forward. If my hamstrings have a lot of tone in them, they're also hip extensors, but they're also knee flexors. So I've already, I'm, I've cocked my leg back. I've already got my knee in a flex position. I want my quads to be able to fire really rapidly. And they're the things that have that stretch being put through them when that knee is bent back behind you. So I want to turn off the muscles that would slow down the motion I'm trying to do. I want to inhibit the opposite group. So that's what's meant by reciprocal inhibition. Autogenic inhibition, the muscle itself decreases its own tone. Reciprocal inhibition, the opposite muscle in a paired grouping of muscles at a joint is going to turn off the um, antagonist. The, agonist, the stretch in the agonist will turn off the tone in the antagonist so the agonist can work better without as much having to overcome the resistance of the antagonist. So important concepts for, for understanding when we talk about PNF, those two things right there. When we look at our stretch reflex, um, and we didn't get a chance to use the reflex hammers last semester, um, but we'll try and start working those in as we're in labs this week so you can kind of see how that works. Um, Reflex hammer tests, when we, whether we're testing for you know, patellar tendon reflex, the Achilles tendon, um, biceps, any, you can test a lot of different muscles with it. Um, it is a activation of the muscle spindle. You strike the tendon, it puts a quick stretch on the muscle, and that sends a rapid message to the spinal cord, doesn't go up to the brain, that says, ah, my muscle's stretching too quickly, fire it, so it contracts, so it doesn't keep stretching too far. And that's why when you strike that hammer in the right spot, your leg will kick out. Your quad is contracting reflexively to protect it, even though it's not really that dangerous of a thing. Now, at the same time, a lot of times you're also going to get some reciprocal inhibition with that. Because we have put that quick stretch through the quad, and it's about to fire, in order for it to fire best, we want to decrease the tone in the hamstrings. So while this talks about it being a monosynaptic reflex, um, you do see a couple, you do see another pathway that's shown in the spinal cord, and that's more the inhibitory pathway that's trying to inhibit the tone in that hamstring so that you can get a good kick um, and get that true nervous system response. So that's kind of an example of more the reciprocal inhibition that we might have occurring. All right, so these stress and strain concepts are um, very relevant for understanding of why we need to hold a stretch for a long period of time if we truly are trying to make some gains in those tissue lengths. Um, we have these different terms. We have the toe region. The toe region, when we look at a muscle's available range of motion across its joint, is basically the taking up the slack. Um, we can move the joint a certain amount and just soft tissue structures, the joint capsule can be getting tight. And then eventually we're gonna actually start putting some tension through the tendon and the muscle itself. So it's that very first part, just taking up the slack as termed the toe region. Once we start 
moving that body part and putting a little bit more stretch through muscle, and then we get into the elastic region. And if we're in the elastic region, as soon as we reduce that force, the muscle is going to go right back to its resting length. We haven't changed anything. We're just, it's just like that rubber band. We've stretched it out and now we're going to let it go and it's going to go right back how it used to be. So it's what's called recoverable deformation. We didn't really make any change at all. If we are truly trying to make long-term gains in the length of the muscle, we need to go beyond the elastic range and get it into the plastic range where we're gonna see some change. Now we have this kind of hump in the middle and that's kind of our optimal range is really kind of the first part of that hump. We wanna get into that plastic range a little bit, but not too far. We are potentially gonna break apart some adhesions, break apart some little connective tissue fibers and things like that. And if we do it in a limited amount, then we can make some gains in the length of the muscle or the tendon or whatever other connective structures are limiting that motion. But if we go too far and we start moving into this downside of this curve, then we get to this thing called necking. And necking is larger amounts of tissue failure that now might actually weaken the integrity of that whole musculotendinous unit. So we do have to be somewhat cautious that we don't overstretch things and actually cause significant tearing we're trying to get like minor tearing essentially by being in this between this x and y range um, that's kind of where we want to apply the force and make some plastic permanent gains in the length of that by making some limited amount of collagen fail um, so that the tissue is no longer adhered down and limited in its range of motion if we get too much necking then we'll actually tear things considerably and might cause failure um, by pushing things too far, too soon, too aggressively. So it is a kind of a little bit limited window. Um, again, we, want, we have to get past elastic. If we don't get past elastic and into plastic, we're not gonna have any really change at all. It's just, it's more equivalent to kind of range of motion. We're just lengthening it and going back, lengthening it and going back. It's not really creating a big change in, in available range. All right, creep um, versus stress relaxation. So creep is really significant, especially when we look at um, that viscoelastic property of the connective tissues um, that are around the muscle itself. Um, and so creep, basically if we put a low load and apply it for a long duration, we're giving that gelatinous matrix, that ground substance, the chance to kind of shift and gradually move and lengthen just a little bit. Um, and over time, the muscle will, the musculotendinous unit will get longer and increase its available range of motion, increase the flexibility of that. Um, now we want to use a constant load, so we're not just making it heavier and heavier and heavier. If we make it heavier and heavier and heavier while we're doing this, then the chance that we have necking and failure starts to increase. But if it's a low load, then what we're shooting for is more that plastic change, that we're getting some tissue deformation, some plastic change that's then going to help things a little bit. Now, while we're applying that, you can see time on the bottom and length of tissue change on the, on the, on the y-axis going up. Um, most of that occurs early on, um, but if we hold it longer, then it also has the advantage of kind of letting the tone in the muscle relax, and then the two, those two things kind of put together will better help us actually cause plastic change in the connective tissues and the collagens that are binding things down. Um, so we're decreasing the internal tone of the muscle, that resting tone when we get this stress relaxation. And if we hold that stretch for a long enough time, then we're also getting that creep where the viscoelastic properties are allowed to take place and get that gradual lengthening out of those tissues. Now it has been shown if we do cyclical loading that we'll get faster deformation. Cyclical loading meaning we're gonna stretch it, we're gonna back off. We're gonna stretch it, we're gonna back off. We're gonna stretch it, we're gonna back off. Um, but it also comes with a little bit more um, risk potentially that we might stretch too far. 
and we're not likely to see quite as much stress relaxation with cyclical loading um, when we do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so our collagen, again, if we're trying to stretch it and lengthen it, um, we don't want it to tear too much of it. We need to tear a little bit to make those gains, but if we tear too much, then we're in that necking and failure thing. So it can be kind of a uh, delicate balance and things that will set collagen up to be weaker and more likely to go into necking and failure are immobilization. We're coming out of a cast, we're coming out of a brace, we haven't been moving that body part much. We really need to proceed with caution because what we would think of as a normal amount of force for uh, somebody that has been moving around is probably too much force and is likely to cause too much collagen damage. Um, same thing with, with inactivity. Um, if they haven't been moving it in a while, it's that use it or lose it principle. It's not quite ready to take on a whole lot of force when we do start moving it. Um, corticosteroids have been shown to weaken collagen. And so corticosteroids, we're talking about things like prednisone, things like dexamethasone, um, things like if you have a, ever had an epidural injection, they'll typically use corticosteroids for those type of things. And is a fairly common technique to calm inflammation down is to use a corticosteroid. Um, what they've found is if you have like a tendonitis and you get a, a steroid injection in that tendon, it will calm the inflammation down, but it also weakens the collagen and makes it more likely to tear and rupture. And so they, you know, they used to do things like this a decent amount for like plantar fasciitis to just help the person deal with things a little bit better. And they found that if we do too many of them, then you can actually just tear the thing completely mm -hmm. instead of just calming the inflammation down. Similarly, we won't tend to, um, Similarly, we won't tend to see people use these for back pain very often. Um, sometimes they'll do injections for back pain um, to calm down irritation of nerve roots coming out of the spine, um, to calm down problems associated with disc issues. Um, but those are usually, they're usually limited to a series of three of those in a given time frame. Like, I can't remember if it's like, you can do up to three in a six month period or up to three in a year period, and then you have to like take a break. So it can be a short-term way to calm things down, but they know if they give too many of these injections, the likelihood of that tissue failing and causing even bigger problems than just pain is much higher. So we don't want to do too many of those. And if you're thinking about getting one yourself for some reason in the future, think twice about it. Because if you can manage that inflammation and pain without that injection, the overall integrity of your tissues is going to be helped in the long term. Um, scar tissue is weaker. Um, so if you've had an injury, a muscle pull, an ankle sprain, um, anything in those parts that you're trying to now stretch, um, where we've replaced, say, actin or myosin fibers in a muscle with just chunks of collagen that are linking those remaining actin or myosins together, that collagen-based connection is going to tend to be weaker. The tissue's not as well organized. The, the geometric structure alignment is not correct. And so it is holding things together is what a scar does. It fills in the defect, but it doesn't move the same way. It doesn't have the same amount of elasticity. And so when we start putting more force through it, it's more likely that it's going to tear again. Um, people that have nutritional or hydration limitations, their tissue is going to tend to be a little bit weaker hormone imbalances, we look at things like um, estrogen, testosterone, growth hormone, thyroid hormones. Um, there's a number of different hormones that might set somebody up for having, um, being more susceptible to injury if we push things too far. And then as we get older, everything gets stiffer and more brittle, more likely to tear instead of stretch. And then dialysis, I'm not sure what it is about the dialysis process, but probably just the chemical imbalance in the body is so out of whack and might be related to the actual fluid that they use to cause the, the waste products to move out of the blood that might have some effect. I'm not 100% sure on that. 
All right, so in addition to stretching, we have some other techniques that we can do to help improve the movement of soft tissue structures, whether we're talking about joint capsules, ligaments, tendons, fascia, whatever the case might be. So we've got our different types of stretching. Manual stretching is kind of like passive range. Something else is providing the force, um, whether it's the person um, or, or some other implement um, or the person's own body weight might be that external force too. Um, mechanical would be um, things like a CPM device um, or if we put somebody in cervical traction or lumbar traction, or we put somebody in what's called a Dyna splint is the most common type of splint. Um, that's an adjustable splint that we can progressively increase the range on. Um, it are other ways that we can stretch. And then assisted. So this is the patient actively moving the body part themselves. So we'll kind of look at all those here in just a sec. Um, We'll talk about the different PNF techniques and, and using those principles of autogenic inhibition, reciprocal inhibition as things to help with that. Um, facilitation is usually less what we'll do for stretching PNF techniques and more what we would want to do with strengthening PNF techniques. We're trying to help the muscle do its job better and generate force with facilitation. With inhibition, we're trying to decrease tone, increase length. Um, Muscle energy techniques um, are ones, the ones I'm most familiar with deal mostly with the SI joints and the pelvic alignment and things like that. I think we'll talk about that next week um, a little bit more when we get into the joint mobilizations too. Um, those are very specific, very directed techniques um, at the joint itself, typically. Not so much with the muscle length, but mostly with the joint itself. And then we can look at soft tissue work. Um, Massage techniques, using trigger point things to kind of reduce tone in the muscle, myofascial release. Myofascial release is believed to try and help with the different layers of fascial or connective tissues in the body. And, and they typically are done with longer holds um, so that we do let the viscoelastic properties that we see with all those collagen heavy tissues kind of take effect and allow for some true lengthening with that. And then neural tissue mobilization, um, we typically talk about nerve glides and nerve flossing. Nerves don't like to be stretched. Um, so we do we want to be really cautious. We pretty much never hold those nerve stretches for any length of time because it's just likely to make them angry and cause more problems. Um, so typically when we're moving a nerve, we want to limit it to a pretty small arc of motion and just kind of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Or if we're doing a flossing technique, if we pull on one end of the nerve, then we kind of have to give at the other end of the nerve and move it closer. If you think about flossing your teeth, how do you put the floss in between and then you move it back and forth? That's what nerve flossing is. We're kind of trying to just make it move um, in its space without really tugging on it and lengthening it too much. All right, so when we think about helping people stretch, um, alignment and stabilization is really important. We don't want somebody stretching a body part where they're way out of balance and it makes them put their muscles in bad positions. We really have to understand our kinesiology with this. Where is the origin and insertion? Which planes of movement do those muscles create? And if we're trying to lengthen a muscle, then we need to kind of think about aligning it with the plane that it works in and then moving it in that direction so that we can lengthen it with good bony alignment so that we don't overstretch things that we don't want to stretch, like joint capsules potentially or ligaments that we want to be stable and not too long. Um, we can use those five drum components and apply them to stretching as well. How often are you going to do it? How much force are you going to put on it? How long are you going to hold that stretch? What kind of speed of motion you're going to do? And, and all those things. So with most of our patient types, we're really trying to lengthen those tissues out. So we typically do things slower and more gently. With a healthy athlete who's trying to warm up for a sport, then we want to think about more dynamic stretching movements that are going to replicate what the muscle's about to do in that activity. We want to take it through the range of motion that it's likely to do in the sport, and that's going to help prepare it to be 
less susceptible to injury. Um, but to do a long, slow stretch and then go run out on the field, that's pretty much been shown to not be a good idea. Better to just do the high knees, the butt kicks, the arm, you know, flapping your arms back and forth and things like that to uh, limber things up a little bit. Our duration, static stretch, most common that you'll hear about is just holding things for like 20 to 30 seconds. There's a lot of people that feel like that's just too short. We're not going to let the viscoelastic properties take place. We're not really going to do anything much beyond just the elastic part of the stretch. Um, there's a PT whose name's Kelly Starrett. Starrett. He's a big CrossFit guy. And then his big thing is you need to hold a stretch for at least two minutes. So you're really kind of wasting your time. It's not really going to change anything about the muscle. And if we're truly trying to overcome things like contractures, then we really need to be looking at way longer than that even. And so that LLLD is low load, long duration. So we're just letting the weight of the limb do the stretch, like say a prone knee hang, where you lay on the plinth, where the edge of the plinth is hitting you at the distal thigh um, and your lower leg is unsupported. We hang out in that position with our tibia, fibula, foot hanging off unsupported then it will help extend the knee with just the weight of those lower leg bones and muscle mass being the load. And we're gonna hold that position for a long period of time. And that's where we can get more of that plastic change without too much force that's gonna cause a lot of the necking and failure, but will let us get some plastic change to truly lengthen things out a little bit. And then we've got our different types that we can do as well. All right, so the term manual stretch um, means you are doing the stretch on somebody else. Um, so we're in charge of how much force we're putting through, the, we're in charge of helping align things, stabilize things correctly. We're the ones deciding whether we're gonna hold it for a given period of time, whether we're gonna go back and forth, whether we're gonna try and lengthen both arcs of motion, both the flexion range and the extension range, for example, or if we're just focusing on just the flexion range because they already can do well with the extension component. Um, we can make it passive or assisted so they can kind of help us or we can just do all the work and then we can also do some different PNF techniques in manual mode also to kind of help lengthen things. Self-stretching is just what we do for ourselves. We are the force either by using our body weight and gravity or putting ourselves in a given position and posture and holding that position so there is tension being put through those tissues. Um, so these are what we'll typically prescribe for patients as part of their home exercise program. Um, we're only seeing most of these patients, you know, two, three times a week in, in many settings. And so they need more than that to really lengthen a muscle. So we will often prescribe stretching to be done multiple times a day, many different stretches. Um, so they're having a better chance of keeping it in a lengthened position and not letting it get back into that shortened position. Super important that we give very clear instruction about alignment, about how, what it should feel like for that patient um, and, and how they need to make sure that they're stable and steady when they do it. You know, if you look at the, the gentleman on the right that's doing this kind of lunge stretch with a little bit of a lean, trying to get some torso lengthening, some lat lengthening, as well as the hip flexor lengthening on that um, back leg, there's a lot to control. Um, and it's a much harder position to hold your balance and make sure that you can let the muscle relax. It's harder to be in a relaxed position like this to decrease that tone compared to the woman that's just bending forward at the waist and, and reaching past her toes. She's, her whole body, her whole lower half of the body is on the ground. She's totally in control of how far she's gone down. Her body, her upper body is supported on her legs. So she's in a much more stable position and it's gonna be easier for her to just let those muscles relax that she's trying to target compared to the, the guy that's leaning over to the side, challenging his base of support. Um, and trying to just kind of stretch multiple muscle groups in different planes at the same time. 
um, mechanical stretching using some device to do the stretch. And that blue brace, that's a Dyna splint. Um, so you see it's got metal supports on the sides. And then you have a little dial that you can set and you can change that angle. So this is a great way to do a low load, long duration stretch. We're going to have that person, we're going to get their elbow as straight as we can get it and then put them in that splint for a number of hours or maybe a day. And then the next day we're going to come back and we're going to see if we can lengthen it out a little bit more and then lock the dial into a more extended position. And then over time, we will regain that length. And this is a pretty common thing when people have like been in a sling for a long period of time or had a fracture in the arm for a long time where they've been casted that they might have this contracture develop in the elbow. And, and dynasplints are a great way to kind of work somebody gradually out of that contracted position. I'm sure they're not comfortable to wear because you have this constant tension on tight muscles and tight connective tissues, but um, they do get used to it and it does help the muscle decrease its tone and, and kind of quit resisting it and gradually improve the length of that. Now in the clinic, you may have seen people do things like we've got over on the right to try and work on the extension. We've got the feet and lower legs elevated with the roll so that they're lifted off the ground. And then we've got these cuff weights draped across both the proximal tibia fibula as well as the distal femur. So that we've got a little bit of extra force. Again, it's a low load. Those are probably, it looks like they're three and a half pound weights, two and a half pound weights. So it's not a ton of weight, but it's more than just gravity. Um, you can certainly do this with disc gravity, um, but by adding a little bit of extra force on there, you're going to get a little bit more force going through there and potentially a little bit more lengthening going on. Um, static stretch, um, then that's our, what we commonly do. Um, that's holding that for a given length of time. And 30 seconds is kind of the most common kind of benchmark that is used with that. Um, I'm not sure that there's tons of research that says 30 seconds is better than 10 seconds is 30 seconds is not as good as a minute. Um, it's just kind of evolved into one of these things that there's probably some studies that said 20 to 30 seconds, but I think it is going to be dependent on the force. How much force are you putting through it for that 30 seconds? If you put more force for a lower period of time, you might get the same change as moderate force for 30 seconds or low force for 60 seconds. Um, so those dynamics might be, it might be a combination of those factors. How, how much are you leaning into the stretch and how long are you holding that stretch? And so you can do static stretching, either I can do it on a patient manually, a patient can be taught to do it themselves. They can do it passively where they're just letting gravity do the work or they can do what's called an active stretch. And I'll talk about active stretch in just a sec. Um, this is one of the studies that um, came out that talked about why we don't want to do static stretching before trying to generate a lot of force with the muscle. Um, and so if we do um, greater than 60 second stretch, you can induce a transient muscle inhibition. So it makes it harder to engage that muscle if it's inhibited. If we go less than 60 seconds, that's pretty minimal. So we don't want to do a lot of really prolonged static stretching before trying to generate a lot of force. Um, the research shows that you're less capable of generating a lot of force if you do that. And in most sports, you want to have your maximum force producing capabilities available to you if you want to be successful in that activity. All right, cyclical stretching. Um, we're gonna not hold things for quite as long. You're gonna get to end range and then hold it for a period of time and then back off and then hold it for a period of time and then back off and then hold it for a period of time and then back off. Um, the CPM machines, which I think there's a picture of coming up. Sorry, maybe I already showed it. They've been on the range of motion slides. Um, those often have settings where you can, you can have the person just do range of motion where it's just going to bend the knee, straighten the knee, bend the knee, straighten the knee, bend the knee, straighten the knee. And you can also set it so there's a pause at each end. So let's say this person already had full extension 
but they were lacking flexion. You can have them in the CPM, so it's bending and straightening the knee, but when you get to the flexion range, you can set the timer on it so it's going to hold them at, for five seconds at their end range flexion position or hold it for 10 seconds there. So they're combining kind of a range of motion with a little bit of a stretch at the end of it. Um, but cyclical just means you're not holding it for a long period of time, but you are doing essentially multiple reps with some force being applied and then kind of backing off. If we look at passive stretch versus active stretch, um, a passive stretch is the person's just leaning into the stretch and holding it, or they're using, letting gravity do the work for them. Um, an active stretch, you're actually trying to use more of that reciprocal inhibition as a way to improve the length of that stretch. So I'm going to um, flip on my camera here real quick and, and share this and kind of show how, how you might do those two things differently. All right, so I've got my little plank set up here. And if I'm just trying to do a passive stretch for my hamstrings, I can just put my leg up on the plinth and then just lean forward. And I'm going to go until I feel there's good tension there, and then I can just hang out. And if I'm doing a static stretch for 30 seconds, I can hold this position for 30 seconds and then back off. If I want to make it cyclical, I could potentially hold it for 5 or 10 seconds, back off for just a second, and then come down and do it again. Again, this is passive. I'm not moving this limb. I'm not contracting any of the muscles here. All I'm doing is letting my body weight be the force. And I'm shifting my pelvis forward so that the origin is moving further away from the insertion. And that's going to lengthen the hamstrings just a little bit as I do that. If I want to stretch my hamstrings actively, then I can get on the plinth. I can lay down get my knee or get my hip to 90 degrees of flexion, and then I can just try to extend the knee as much as I can. And so I'm engaging my quads to do knee extension, and that's going to reciprocally inhibit my hamstrings. So they're less likely to restrict that knee extension motion because these muscles are firing and my nervous system is saying, hey, these muscles are trying to work. Let's turn off the ones here and help it do its job more effectively. So that's kind of what an active stretch would be. We're engaging the opposite muscle from the one that we're trying to lengthen. By actively contracting it, we get some reciprocal inhibition to turn it off and make it more likely to be able to go further. All right. Let's see. Turn that off. Should have done that earlier. And go back to share my screen. Okay, so this Spider-Man doll can just hang out and hold that stretch for a long time because it doesn't actually have muscles. Um, so active versus passive. Pros and cons to both. Again, the active stretch, we are going to try to help get that reciprocal inhibition. With a passive stretch, we might get a little bit more autogenic inhibition because we're putting tension through that hamstring by leaning our body weight forward, then that tension might tell the GTO, hey, that's too much force. And the GTO is like, hey, well, let's decrease the tone in that muscle so that it can lengthen. So passive stretching, more likely to use the autogenic inhibition. Active stretching, more likely to use reciprocal inhibition. All right, and P and F, we can use both. Um, and again, depends on which particular technique you're doing, um, which of these will work. And there are some videos, your, your book, um, the F.A. Davis book has a lot of videos in there. The F.A. Davis is the publisher, but the, the therapeutic exercise book. So I'm gonna show you how to get there real quick. Um, and hopefully I can do this where you can see it. All right. So this is, 
I have an account and you guys should be able to create an account as students. You won't have all the same features that I get as an instructor. Um, and because I have an account and I use, we use this publisher's books for a number of classes, I can scroll down and find the book that I'm interested in. So we have this, this is our book here. And so I can click on therapeutic exercise. And if you look at the resources, um, this is the drop down for the resources. You can go to open access free. I don't even think you need an account to get to this. And there's a bunch, a bunch of videos that are in here. Oops, I might be a Jensen sample. There we go. Let's do that. So I'm going to scroll down and you can see all these different videos. A lot of these techniques that we'll do this semester in lab and class, you can find videos here if you need to review them on your own or get another person's take on it. Um, so we're going to go up here to PNF stretching techniques and click on that. Um, let me, I don't know if I can make that bigger or not. All right, so this is about a minute long, a little over a minute. She's going to go through two different PNF stretching techniques, and then I'll kind of demonstrate them and, and talk them, talk through them, and then I might have, have you guys pause the video and try them on yourself um, to see how, how it works. So she's going to talk about what's called hold relax, and then another technique called hold relax agonist contract, which combines two different techniques. We have a hold relax technique, we have an agonist contract technique, and you can do them in combination with one another too. So let's watch this little video clip real quick. Two techniques are used to increase flexibility and range of motion, hold relax and hold relax agonist contract. With both techniques, the range limiting muscle is first lengthened to the point of limitation. The patient then performs an isometric contraction for 5 to 10 seconds, followed by voluntary relaxation of the tight muscle. With the hold relax technique, the limb is passively moved into the new range, elongating the range limiting muscle. With the hold relax agonist contract technique, the patient actively moves the limb through the new range by contracting agonist muscles. In this example of increasing straight leg raising, the hamstrings are the tight muscle group to be stretched and the hip flexors are the agonists. All right, let me close that and close that and get back to where we were. So we've got these techniques down here. And so we just saw hold relax first, and then she did the hold relax in combination with the agonist contract. And so hold relax is using the GTO. So we're trying to use the autogenic inhibition part. And so if you think back to what you saw in that video, she put the person up at whatever 50, 60 degrees of flexion at the hip, had the knee straight. She blocked the guy's lower leg, gave him something to push against, and so then he contracted his hamstrings to try and do hip extension. She wasn't letting him go into hip extension, but he's generating force in that muscle, and that's kicking in the GTO and the autogenic inhibition so that the muscle tone lessens, and now we can move into more hip flexion, and you don't have as much resistance to that. And so you do multiple bouts in a row, holding it for about five to 10 seconds, so these are not long enough to see any kind of true plastic change, any kind of viscoelastic change in the connective tissues. They're solely going to change the tone in the muscle to let you have a little bit more motion. With agonist contract, you're basically trying to use the hip flexor muscles, so in this case like rectus femoris, to pull the hip into more flexion. And by engaging those hip flexor muscles, it inhibits reciprocally the hip extensor muscles, the hamstrings in this case. And so she had him do the same basic technique to start, did the hold relax part where he pushed into her hand, and then she had him actively try to engage his hip flexors and pull himself into more hip flexion. And he was able to do so because you decreased 
the tone in those hamstring muscles and let you have more available range of motion. So she demonstrated that last part at the bottom. You can do agonist contract just by itself. You can do a hold relax just by itself. Contract relax is very similar to hold relax. We'll get into that in lab. Um, it involves muscles that can also rotate. So when we look at things like shoulder and hip that have multi-planar motions, then you can basically do a hold relax technique, but you let the rotational component happen, but you don't let the either frontal plane motion or sagittal plane motion happen. So that's a little bit trickier and we'll, we'll do that. It's easier to kind of see that in person. And again, these are really just changing tone in the muscle. So they're great when people have guarding in the muscles, not that the tissue is really tight, they just don't want to move it. It's great with people that have neurological problems with spasticity. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and kind of show this and how you can do it on yourself um, a couple different ways. So you could do it in standing, just like I showed earlier. I can put my leg up here and I can just lean forward till I get to where I feel tension in that hamstring. Once I in, in this position, then I can try and just dig my heel down into the table and hold that for about five seconds and then relax. And I should be able to go forward a little bit further and then dig down for five or 10 seconds and relax. And then you should be able to go a little bit further. Um, so that's one way that you could do it yourself. You could certainly also get in the same position that she had the patient in and just use a loop or a belt and do the same thing here. So I could bring my leg up to this position where I feel tension and then I could try and push and pull down. So I'm kicking in those hamstrings, hold that for five seconds and then relax and be able to pull a little bit higher up. So dig in and relax and come a little bit further. It, it's pretty dramatic. Sometimes, especially for the hamstrings, how much you can actually help somebody move further and further as they do that with those techniques. So we will practice those in lab and um, we'll come back to them in some other classes as we go as well, go through the program. For sure in neuro, um, we'll do it, but we'll do it here too. All right, just a little bit more. I know this is kind of long, I apologize for having Martin Luther King, King Day, um, where I didn't account for that in my original schedule. Not that I would have had any more time available. All right, so we've done, talked about those. And again, we'll, we'll practice all these in lab so you have a good sense of what to do. And I think really that's pretty much it for um, this stretching component. Um, there are just the last few little review slides, things to kind of think about and understand moving forward with this. And then these case studies, I believe, will be in class or in lab today or this week or next week. If you're in lab one, you may not get to it this week, but we'll work it in as we go. So um, that's it. And um, we'll see people in class this week and hope you have enjoyed your extra day of weekend.